for the Lord Jesus, a wonderful round of applause. My dear brethren, God is awesome, folks. When we understand the word of the Lord, he operates in our lives in the name of Jesus. I promised you that today I would convey a message of great importance to change your lives. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 27. This is the message that I promised I would deliver to you today. Oftentimes we think that God has given up on us or that God is full of wrath because our works are wicked. It's true that God does not condone wicked works, but the Lord loves sinners. He hates sin. If God happened to hate us, we would be completely destroyed by now. The nation of Israel in the kingdom of David was a complete and united kingdom. David never lost a single battle. Solomon inherited it, and it continued to be united and powerful. But at the end of Solomon's life, it happened that he backslid, and he yielded to sin. And what happened next? The nation was divided in two. Jeroboam led the sedition. Ten tribes made up the northern kingdom that retained the name of Israel, and two remained faithful to the house of David, Judah and Benjamin. What happened to Israel was wrong from the beginning until the very end. Jeroboam was the first king, and after him there were many others. There was Ahab, and it was during the reign of Hoshea, Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, besieged that nation, led them to captivity, and they were never able to get back on their feet again. They were completely forgotten, and only Judah remained. Then Isaiah, used by the Lord, spoke the following words to Israel. He speaks to me and to you. Reading from verse 4, from Isaiah 27, verse number 4. Fury is not in me. That's it. That's the complete message. God was furious against sin, not against them, but they didn't understand it. But now we understand that they had prospered a lot and abandoned God. And that happens with some people today. They come to God's house with their life in shambles, down in the dumps, unable to make ends meet, in a grave situation, and God works out their problem. And then they end up waving goodbye to God. Is God angry at them? God feels sorry for them, in fact, because he will keep on being God, having them by his side or not. But they will be lost forever. And they will be lost for being foolish. If God got serious with them, with his breath, because Jesus will kill the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. He would just blow him away, and he will disappear completely. And if God became furious with people, he just had to blow them away, and they would disappear. But God is not furious at them. There is no fury in the Lord God, but what is there in the heart of God? There's love and compassion. There's mildness. In the Lord's heart, there is mercy. There's leniency. There is salvation for everyone, but they didn't understand that. They could have simply converted and God would have turned their kingdom into the most important one on earth, but they did not convert. As many people don't, due to silly things. I don't belong to that religion. What religion, brethren? Religion can't save you. Not one of them. Churches can't save you. There's only one savior and that is Jesus Christ, the one who said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. And if he is not what he claims to be, then he is a big fat liar, folks. How is it possible that he could be one of the prophets of God if he says he is the way? So does that mean the prophet is lying? God the Father would be evil if he had sent a prophet who lied to us. Jesus never lied. He always spoke the truth. The Lord is simply looking at you and giving you a chance. And it is written here, fury is not in me. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? And what does this mean? We have to get the Lord, who is a man of war, get into battle with us. I mean, on our behalf. And how do we do that? By believing in his word, claiming the promises he made, ordaining that which belongs to us. When he is in combat, in a battle, what is it that we must do here today? We have to gather up the briars and the thorns the things that are not good for us. Briars and thorns for farmers are plagues. They're good for nothing. They gather them up and set them on fire, and we have to gather them and put them in the hands of the Lord. My God, I have thoughts that are unpure. I have unrestrained desires. Lord, I am in need of your deliverance. Here are the briars and the thorns as well. This temptation and this evil, and destroy them. 
Dear brethren, the moment he's waging war, the moment when we're praying, at that moment you mustn't talk to anyone. Don't stop praying. You have to keep fighting. God, I'm still not finished. Let me tell you a few more things. Oh, Lord God, there is still a problem in my life. I have a secret desire. I have a tribulation. I have been suffering. I have issues. I feel hate. I feel, I, I feel, I feel so angry at someone that I want to destroy them. Jesus, I have a weakness. I have been having wrongful thoughts. Jesus, I put them all in your hands. God, man of war, destroy them all. At that moment, the work is done. We just can't stop. Of course the enemy causes your knee to hurt, causes you to feel very tired. But don't become tired. Don't accept it. You're here to wage war and to become strong. And you will make it. The Lord will grant you your victory. Who would set briars and... Let's read the verse here. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? It must be before the Lord, in the Lord's presence. I would go through them. I would burn them together. He is a consuming fire. Whatever is bothering you, it is a briar. It's a thorn bush. It's a weedy plant that has no value. Set them before the Lord. Lord, destroy them all. And God will say, I would go through them and I'd burn them together. Not separately, because God can do all things, whether it's moral weakness, whether it's a weakness of, of character, or a physical weakness Set them all in front of God because he will burn them together and leave no trace. The moment the Lord is in battle and you feel it, then that is the time. God is using the preacher. He's speaking and you're praying and then you feel it. God, now is the time to burn them all. There's this sin and he binds it together. Burn this one, Jesus. Burn them all. Burn them, burn them, destroy them. Set them all on fire. God is a consuming fire and will put an end to this evil that's been pestering you, that's destroying you. This is the message God gave to me and it will turn you into a blessing. My brethren, God put it in the Bible, not for us to look at and go, oh, it's nice, isn't it? God's really awesome. No, it's really great, Lord, and you'll do that for me. I believe it because without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. I want your help right now. I will be able to get rid of the briars of any kind of thorn bushes. Thorns are no good at all. They pierce into your flesh. They pierce the soles of your feet. They cause pain. They tear your hand. They tear your clothes. And they may tear your eyes. Some farmers have lost their eyes when walking amid the thorns. They weren't careful and the thorn ended up piercing one of their eyes. So they're not good. You have to gather all the sins that you've committed, all the diseases as well, all the weaknesses that you have. Gather them all and say, Lord, bind them all together and burn them up in your furnace. You are a consuming fire and I will be rid of them. My Lord, I'm free. I don't have any of them. I believe and at that moment you say, I'm delivered. From what? From that moral weakness, that evil is over. My God, who is a consuming fire, burn them all and the victory is mine in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen, brethren. Let me pray with you now. God, thank you so much. Oh my God, today when we pray the prevailing prayer, I want everybody to get the briars and the thorn bushes and all that is evil and hand them to you, to cast them into your fire. And God, I'm sure you will burn them all today. You'll vanish them, God. Today is the day when you will turn these people into brand new creations and they will certainly become very, very blessed. Oh my God, thank you so much, Jesus. And we thank you for showing us through your scriptures what belongs to us and what we can receive from you. Lord, some people here are facing a strong moral temptation and they're always thinking of forbidden things. And now they're delivering their life into your hands and saying, I don't want this anymore. Some people are always committing sins. Oh my God, but they're saying, I don't want this anymore. Others are jealous. They are covetous. They would never bother to pray to you and ask for inspiration, but they're always stealing and snitching things. They steal intellectual products. They steal spiritual things and material things. Oh my Lord, may these people stop right now and cast it all into a furnace to burn it, God. You'll burn it and those things will come to an end. 
I want to see all these people being delivered. My people are not snitches. They are not dishonest. My people are not adulterous. They are not false. These people are coming into your presence because they are your people. They need improvement. They need transformation. They need the everlasting inheritance that is in Christ Jesus. Even if someone has been unfaithful to these people, may they remain faithful because they cannot deny that you are a faithful God and that you you are present in their lives. Oh, Father, thank you. Receive the briars now. Get the bushes that we are delivering into your hands, my Lord. They are causing us harm, and these people are now completely blessed for your glory in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you say, Amen. Oh, glory to God. Isn't God good, brethren? So, Thank you, Jesus. He has much more to say to us. But now let's go to the real life drama segment for today. Twenty two years ago, I took a tumble and I hurt my knee in the fall. From that moment on, I couldn't work anymore. I wore a cast and I wore it for quite a while. I took it off and got better, right? Apparently, but it was never really healed. From that moment on, she started to feel excruciating pain. Sometimes she wouldn't sleep at night because of the pangs she felt in her knee. It wasn't easy at all because even when she walked, she had to lean on us. The pain was such that I asked God to take my life. It seemed like my bones were being severed. She was completely depressed, you know, always crying without any desire to, to live. She couldn't bend over to do the house chores and climbing the stairs or getting on the bus was very difficult. After undergoing lots of examinations, Marisa found out she was suffering from osteoporosis. This is a disease characterized by progressive deterioration of bone tissue and increased bone fragility. She started to do her treatment, but it didn't work at all. She had a brief relief, but the pain would return stronger and stronger. There was nothing else to be done on my knee. It's worn out, and they told me, Marisa, when you turn 60 years old, come here again for an operation. I take lots of anti-inflammatories for the pain, and when I left home for work, I... I couldn't come back and people had to help me. I suffered a lot. She couldn't bend her knee. For her to do that was very difficult. Her eyes would well up with tears. Seven years ago, through one of her nieces, Marisa found the Grace of God Church and started to attend it. I went there every Wednesday and I'd say, no, God will surely heal me. I won't give in to the enemy. Years went by and Marisa kept living with the strong pain in her knee. Years went by and Marisa kept living with the strong pain in her knee. Then, on July 10th of this year, she attended a special meeting held by Dr. Suarez in the city of Porto Alegre and a great miracle took place. And he called all those people who had a problem from the waist down to go up there on the stage for him to bless and pray. And there I went and I felt the most wonderful sensation. I closed my eyes, received my blessing. What is your name, sister? Marisa. Marisa, what was your problem? I have a problem in my knee. It's the cartilage. The cartilage? How were you walking before? I used a cane, but I, after I came here seven years ago, I strengthened my faith and I improved a little. And today I came to be healed. Seven years ago you were here? Yes, but I was using a but cane. But after that time, have you been going to church often or not? I have. I go to the... Oh, uh, the church near your house. Yes. And how were you walking before? I was feeling pain. Show us how you were walking before while you were I limping. I was limping like, like this that? and I had some people to help Leaning me. Leaning on someone. Yes, I did. My, my son-in-law well, brought me here. pretend I am your son-in-law. Let's go now. Is your daughter pretty? My <laughs> wife is very pretty, you know? <laughs> okay. How were you walking? I used to walk like this. So walk normally now. I'm not going to help you. As your pastor, I say walk. Let's applaud Jesus. She said that it seemed her knee was touched. She said she felt some sort of tug in her knee. When I left the church, I forgot I had felt pain. After 22 years, I received that miracle. She walks a lot now. My sister is a new and improved woman. She's much better now in all aspects. I'm pretty sure it was Jesus who healed her. 
I don't feel any pain. I don't know what pain is. I feel I'm healthy. I'm healed. I want to live. Jesus is truly wonderful. He is really awesome. Oh, Jesus, you are so wonderful. What happened to her, brethren? She understood that she had to get the briars and the thorn bushes and give them to Jesus because he's the man of war. The moment you feel he's waging war, go get your briars. You may be 60 years old. You may even be retired from your job, brethren, with all your required rights after having worked so long, but you'll never be old enough. You will have a blazing fire in the name of Jesus. Gather them to be burned because victory comes from God in the name of Jesus. Amen? And now let's go to the question and answer segment for today. Dr. Suarez, do the times of ignorance refer to those who don't know the Lord or to those who don't know parts of the Bible? Dear brother, the minute you get to know a small portion of the Bible, you're no longer in ignorance. You already know the truth. By looking at what is written in the Bible, you feel something in your heart. I know a woman whose name I won't disclose, but she bore a testimony, and she said to me, Dr. Suarez, I had the demon of wickedness in me. Whenever I saw a neighbor getting along with their husband or a colleague in good relationship with theirs, no matter who the woman was, I would hit on their husband until I managed to take the men away from them. When it happened, I was happy. I felt accomplished. One day, I was with a man in a car. It has to do with the question asked. And then we were having a conversation. One word leads to another. And when I opened the glove compartment, I saw a Bible. I'd never seen one. Huh? What's this? When I opened it, I saw a verse and then closed it. God doesn't want this life for me. I changed. It only took a single verse. I had never seen a Bible. And it was in his car. I don't know if the Bible was his or his wife's. <laughs> I had bad intentions. But I grabbed the Bible and opened it, and God spoke to me. Even an evangelical song, when it is inspired, when people hear that evangelical song, they know that is the way for me. So times of ignorance end when you get to know a small portion of the Word of God. One testimony, when someone says something and then it dawns on you, God exists. And I have to amend my ways. And at that moment, it's like a computer chip where you have a file which comprises a whole library and downloaded to a computer in a matter of minutes. You copy and paste and it's saved. Whenever you need it, everything you need to know is saved within your heart. So we have to speak to Jesus, amen? I like that question. Second question now. Dr. Suarez, assuming someone else's error, is it a wise choice? Oh, God forbid, brother. <laughs> so my neighbor does a lot of crazy things, he's a sinner, and I'll assume them? Are you crazy, brother? <laughs> I already have my own problems. I remember when I was a young man, there was a pastor in our church who was a little bit kind of, how shall I put it? How should I say? A little wacky. I don't like to say that word. But he was actually kind of crazy. And a friend once said to me, listen, look out for that man. I said, why? Look how he prays. You know when you're young and you have lots of problems, right? And so he would pray, God, send your predicaments to your church. And he said it, and I'd pray, God, please count me out. That's his prayer. <laughs> I have no part of that. I already had my own problems. Why would I ask God for more? I just couldn't understand that, brethren. Jesus said to us, don't lead us into temptation. Didn't Jesus say that? Not lead us into temptation. He said, don't lead us. But the pastor was saying otherwise. May God have mercy. But some people do that. And then I see someone else, and they're indulging in errors. And will I assume his sin? Of course not, Jesus. I'll bless him in the name of the Lord. I already have my own problems, brethren. I have to cry out in God's presence to avoid sinning, and now I will admit other people's mistakes? My friend, do some good thinking because things are not very clear to you, but God shall grant you victory. And now let's go to the Open Your Heart segment. Dr. Suarez, I am not able to confess my sin to the person whom I have wronged. I feel lost and I fear the person's reaction. Please pray for me and give me guidance as to what I should do. Well, that's between you and God. You have to be in God's presence and speak the truth. Well, from a doctor, we must not hide anything. It's not a wise thing to do when the doctor asks you something and you simply lie about it, but you are suffering. You'll cause the doctor to make a wrong decision, so be honest. You have to speak the truth. If you don't trust one doctor, find one that you can. Some women don't trust men doctors, so see a lady doctor. 
And when she asks something, make sure you tell her the whole truth. God is more trustworthy. You have to say to him, God, I did this, I did that. That's what happened to me. Guide me as to what I should do. You have to be in the hands of the one that you wronged. Jesus said that we are on the way. He said, agree with your adversary while you are on the way with him. Lest he delivers you to the judge, the judge hand you to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. You have to do that. You have to say, I'd like to speak seriously with you. You can't, but weren't you brave enough to do wrong? Don't do that. Shall we be reconciled to everyone? When I was a student of law, uh, there was a professor who said many silly things. One day I said, I just can't believe it. The woman stopped and said, girls, pay attention. Everyone stopped. Never ever cheat on your husbands. I thought, what is she doing? She always spoke such nonsense. She had a filthy mouth when telling her anecdotes that we had to, had to turn our ears to the other side. She said, pay attention. Man has virility, which is not sexual power. It is a pride that they have. And cheating sticks in their mind as if it was done yesterday, even after 50 years. But not with women. They are beaten, men batters and bruises the cheating woman. And after a while, we forget about it. But they don't forget. So don't do that, otherwise you put yourselves in serious trouble. And it's true, parents should teach their daughters. We should be teaching all people, and men as well, that they shouldn't cheat because it's so sad. But if you've done it, reconcile. Jesus tells us to do that. While you're on the way, agree with your adversary. I mean, make amends with him while you're still on the way so that he doesn't deliver you to the judge. And the judge doesn't hand you over to the bailiff and the officer, thus avoiding to be thrown into jail. If you've cheated someone, do that. What if he or she leaves you? But it's up to them to decide. You can't act based upon what might come to be. You have to make amends. Jesus said, when you leave your gift before the altar, your life before the altar, and if while you are doing that, you remember that someone from your past holds something against you, he said, leave your gift there. Don't remove it. Go on your way, find that person, and be reconciled to them. Then present your gift. God simply cannot accept a life that has been deceived. And that doesn't stand just for adultery. Remember the man who worked and embezzled. He bought a house, he bought a car and whatnot, but these possessors are not his. They belong to his employer. He has to return them. The most beautiful thing in the world is be set free. Jesus said, which one of you convicts me of sin? But you see, the spirits of demons don't stop working. They'll keep on working. And there are many people who will lose their salvation because if they die on the wrong, there's no way. I always say that God is not the usher of a circus who's at the door collecting people's tickets and he sees a friend and he lifts the tent and psst, psst, come on, hurry up, hurry up, and allows his friend to get in. No, brethren. Each one of us will be judged based upon what we did concerning God's word. It's about time that we come clean. Time to abandon all of our sins, but not only for eternity. Here there are people who are constantly stumbling, 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 and it is impossible that they keep living like that. If you have an evil eye, and when a woman bends over, you start looking at her in hopes to see something, turn your eye to the other side. It is the least you can do, but there are people who are imprudent and... Stop doing such a thing. You are, you are harming your spiritual vision. It is true. The Bible said that when two men in the times of the law were fighting together and the wife, one of them, drew near to rescue him, and if she willfully or unwillingly seized the other by the genitals, they would then cut her hand off. Whoever touches a person who is not their, their other half, their spiritual hand is cut off. They lose power. This is symbolic. If someone was caught in adultery, they'd be stoned to death. Some people are being stoned their whole life. One of these days, the stone will finish them off. It's one stumble after another. It happens. They focus on what they don't have, but they will miss out on what they can have in God. It's like punishment. Their capacity to see is damaged. We must be untarnished people with clean hands, with a clean heart. We don't need anything that is wrong. And you have stumbled, make amends. The Lord is giving you the opportunity to rise up. So seek the Lord and he will give you the strength and you will be a blessing in the name of Jesus.
What does God want? What, what have we learned in Isaiah uh, 27, verse number 4? Let's read it again, brethren, in case you missed it. Some people missed the blessing even though I ministered it. Fury is not in me. God is not furious at you, but he is furious at your transgressions. As to you, he is being merciful. He is giving you a chance. He is giving you the opportunity to be clean, the Lord God is saying. Who would set briars and thorns against me in battle? Set them. Lord God, here are my briars. Here are my thorn bushes. Oh, Lord, you are fighting the battle now. Destroy them all. Some people might think they're setting their problems for God to stumble over. God never stumbles. And at the end, it says, I would go through them. I would burn them together. He burns them all. He gathers them all. Throw them in the fire, and then it's all over. From that moment on, you are free. Oh, brethren, let's take advantage of this time of grace and let's become cleansed, heart, body, soul, and spirit, so that we can be the people that God wants to bless in the name of Jesus. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Not the physical hand, but it's a sin that's in your hand or a sin that's in your eyes. Yank them. He's not telling you to rip them off physically. It's better you enter into the the kingdom without a hand or an eye i mean without the sin that tarnishes you then having both hands and going to hell having both eyes and going to hell you have to take a stand which is very difficult who would be crazy enough to cut off their hand no one but spiritually that is what he is saying you have to abandon what is wrong maybe even losing your job because you don't want to be lost let me pray with you god it has been so beautiful hearing your word today we get to a position, God, in which we can become delivered. And I pray for those who are weak because they really need your help. God, the eternal perdition will have no end. And only a foolish person would despise your invitation, would allow the enemy to keep on dominating them. My God, here is our bush. Here are our thorns. You are at war. Get all these things and burn them for us, God. Destroy them. We don't accept them in any way at all, God. And now I am going to use the power that you have granted me to send all evil away. I'm sending the devil away now. In the name of Jesus, be delivered from all evil. In the name of Jesus, amen.